Hey guys, Quiv the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to another episode in starting astrophotography for lazy people. And in previous sessions, we've covered most of the equipment. We've covered uh, the telescope as well as the camera, how they relate to one another, how they basically did affect what field of view and what resolution, how much detail you can capture, um, they, they will be affecting by working together. We've talked about the mount, the heart of the system, and you can have an excellent telescope uh, with a great you know, resolution that's perfect for your seeing conditions with an awesome camera. Uh, if your mount is not tracking properly and it's not up to the job, then your system will not work. So the mount is another thing uh, we looked at that was uh, very important. We've looked at some other considerations like the back focus, the distance between the last optical elements besides the filter uh, of your telescope to your camera sensor. We've talked about the auto guiding and how the guide camera and the guide scope can basically talk uh, via a computer or sometimes directly to uh, the mount to tell it to redirect its uh, it, uh, to basically to get back on target so you get better uh, tracking of the stars as they uh, move uh, across the sky relative to us to us and by the way there's a lot of wind today uh, so uh, I hope I'm, I'm putting my mic within this jacket here it's super hot by the way uh, but I'm doing it just for you uh, so that you hopefully don't get that much wind noise in uh, the microphone uh, okay so we've looked at all of those details and uh, hopefully you've subscribed and you've clicked on the little notification bell uh, so that you are actually seeing this video this continuation of this series what I have not talked too much about yet is uh, the filter wheel and the autofocuser but those are two very important parts of the system that black thing here is a filter wheel which you will need if you have a monochrome camera I mean you don't need it 100% but if you're lazy you will want an automated filter wheel if you have a monochrome camera if you have a color camera you can as I mentioned in the back focus video uh, make do with um, a filter drawer like this one where you can just uh, take out the drawer screw in your filter put it in there and then just put that in your imaging train or if you're using a refractor with a field flattener and focal reducer then it is absolutely possible to uh, have a two inch filter like most field flatteners and focal reducers while well, the wind most flatteners and uh, focal reducers at their nose they have two inch threads and 48 threads for uh, two inch filters so you can screw in your filter at the nose of the focal reducer and then uh, you don't have to worry about that filter anymore and uh, the filter choice is another thing uh, that, we'll, uh, that we'll look into. But first, let's talk about filter wheel and focuser. And those two are actually related to one another. Uh, so if you're using monochrome, you'll want a filter wheel. The main criteria you want to look at when you're choosing a filter wheel is, uh, first, is it an electronic filter wheel and can it be controlled via USB using ASCOM? If either of the answers there is no, then you do not want that filter wheel. You want an electronically computer controlled filter wheel so that you can be lazy in the end. So that's why we are starting with this particular uh, filter wheel. Uh, this is a ZW EFW, which stands for electronic or electric filter wheel, a very, a very original name. And the filter wheel uh, so that's the main criteria that you want. You also want to check how much back focus it uses. So if you're wondering what that is, you should check the uh, back focus uh, video that I'm linking to uh, up there, which was the, the previous uh, video in this series. Uh, how much of the back focus it eats up and whether it will fit in the back focus that you have in between your telescope and your camera. And you also may want to check the attachment method of the filter wheel to the telescope side and to the camera side. If you have um, a fairly normal optical tube assembly, let's say you're at f4, uh, so at the focal ratio of f4 or higher, uh, then, and you have a camera that is like up to an APS-C 
size sensor, then that's not so much of an issue. If you're going into a full frame camera or an APS-C camera with a very fast imaging train, then uh, the choice of the attachment of the filter wheel to uh, the camera or to the telescope side become important. So let me do something that I really shouldn't be uh, doing. I am just going to uh, unscrew my camera and my filter wheel, which I really don't like doing, but you can see the filter wheel looks like something like this. Uh, I have a video where I actually open the filter wheel and you can see more in detail uh, about like my monochrome um, narrowband filters. So I'm linking to that video above as well if you're interested in how it looks like uh, inside. But you can see that the filter wheel here actually has M42 female threads here and another set of M42 female threads here. And that particular filter wheel from ZWO came also from with adapters to make those threads male if necessary. But they're M42. If you have um, a full frame camera uh, which I hope you don't because it really compl complexifies the whole process if you're a beginner um, and I wouldn't touch a full frame sensor either my optics are not able to support it so I'm not even thinking about it uh, you the, these m42 threads will not be enough you will need bigger threads you will need bigger filters etc etc now one of the things as well when you choose a filter wheel um, is you have multiple filter positions in there so there's a circle that rotates in that filter wheel there's a disc that rotates in that filter wheel and each position has a specific filter this particular filter wheel uh, supports if i remember correctly seven filters uh, 36 millimeters unmounted and you have other versions of that filter wheel that support uh, eight filters of 31 millimeter un unmounted or 1.25 inch mounted filters and you have a more recent filter wheel from ZWU for full frame cameras that supports two inch uh, filters or you have some wheels from Starlight, Starlight Express for example that support two inch filters but can also support M42 connections there uh, so it's all like it's a quite complicated kind of uh, choice but it's not actually that complicated. The first thing you want to think about is what filter size do I need? Do I need 31 millimeter? Uh, do I need 1.25 inch mounted? Do I need 36 millimeters? Do I need bigger filters than that? And for that, the main point that you want to look at is whether your filter could cause vign vignetting. And to do that, there is a way to actually very quickly check whether your filter will cause vignetting. It will depend on the focal ratio of your telescope and on the sensor size of your camera. And I have a video on that. I'm linking to it above and you should really uh, check it out. Uh, it links to a tool where you can see whether a certain filter size would cause vignet vignetting. If you have an F4 system or more and your filter is relatively close to the camera, and your camera size is uh, micro four thirds or less, so your sensor size is micro four thirds or less, then 31 millimeter of R1.25 inch uh, mounted filters are enough. Uh, if you have a faster focal ratio, you may want to look into 36 millimeter filters. And that's the reason I have four, 36 millimeters filters here is just in case I went to very fast optics or that kind of scenario that I have them. Otherwise, there's no real reason to have uh, 36 millimeter filters in my case. So that's the, uh, the filter wheel uh, itself. Uh, how many positions do you want? Well, you have a mini filter wheel from ZW that has five positions, if I remember correctly, for 31 millimeter filters. And this is good if you want to do LRGB, and then you can add H alpha, which is a mono uh, narrowband filter and this is uh, so you could actually like combine luminance and H alpha to have a luminance channel which provides more details to your image and H alpha works extremely well on most uh, em emission nebulae uh, and again for more details you can check the video I linked to earlier about uh, narrowband filters uh, they can really make a big difference when fighting light pollution and then like the uh, RGB filters for red, green, blue. They're basically pieces of glass uh, that are tainted red, green, and blue colors, and they let only one of the, uh, uh, only red, green, or blue through. And the luminance filter is typically uh, also called a UV 
slash IR filter. It blocks ultraviolet, it blocks infrared, it keeps all the rest and uh, that will be like the main kind of information, like the detail layer of uh, the target that you're taking. So if you have monochrome, you want at least uh, four filters, L, R, G, B, maybe ideally even fifth, fifth one like H alpha. And again, for more information, check the narrowband uh, video that, uh, that I have. If you have, if you do not have a narrowband camera, you don't need that filter wheel. Um, you likely need a filter drawer, or you likely need just like to screw in your, your filter into the focal reducer or field flattener uh, that you have so that things are fairly simple and easy. So this is the way that it works on the filter wheel uh, side of things. Now, if you remember from the back focused video that I had in this series, uh, the filter thickness affects uh, the back focus between your telescope and your camera sensor. And why it affects that is because it actually affects the focus point, which means that if you have uh, filters of different thicknesses, uh, which will happen if you have multiple brands, then the ideal focus point of your, uh, uh, will, of your filter will change depending on your filter, which means that when you change the filter, ideally you want to actually refocus your uh, system. And when you're refocusing, obviously, if you want to be lazy, you need an electric focuser uh, also to do autofocusing as well. Uh, there's another reason, like many telescopes, they have trouble focusing red, green and blue light at exactly the same point, in which case, even if you have the same filter thickness, you will want to uh, refocus between filters so that you are perfectly uh, in focus for the particular wavelength of light that you're currently imaging. So that's the filter wheel. Okay, and I've reconnected everything back together, so the filter wheel is back. And now we remember what's important when choosing the filter wheel is it needs to be electronic, it needs to be computer controlled via USB, it needs um, to have the proper filter size based on whatever could cause vignetting in your system, and it, could have, it needs to have the appropriate number of filters. For me, I have LRGB, H alpha, S2, and O3 filters in there. So I'm using all of my seven slots in that uh, particular filter wheel. And uh, the reason I have uh, sulfur 2, S2, and oxygen 3, O3 uh, filters in there is because I like to do narrow band uh, combinations. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope images often have for nebulae uh, images. Now, in addition to the filter wheel, we want an electric and computer controlled focuser and that focuser the one that i have here that little red box uh, here is called the eaf it's uh, the electronic automate automatic uh, focuser by zw and uh, that eaf by the way um, it's uh, you can attach it to a lot of uh, telescopes very easily it, it comes with a variety of attachments um, there are other focus, focuser brands there. There's like uh, the Sesto Senso, there's, there's the Focus Cube, uh, there's a Rigel Sys, there's, um, you can create your own focuser using an Arduino board and a cheap stepper motor. Uh, so you can actually create your own electronic focuser for around like 20 bucks. Um, there's uh, the Rolls Royce of focusers would be Optech and Moonlight that have magnificent focusing solutions for a variety of systems. And in particular, I used Moonlight, Moonlight in the past there. Amazing, and Ron from Moonlight uh, will like look at your system. You can ask him questions about your planned system and tell you what focuser would work well for that. It's not cheap though, but it is truly the Rolls Royce of focusers, at least as far as I'm concerned. Amazing products. Um, the ZWEAF is cheap and works well for me. Um, I did call it, uh, and I quote, I believe I quote a hot piece of garbage uh, in some of my earlier videos because it has a significant amount of backlash, but I'm not going to get into that uh, right now. And um, like other focuses will work just as well. You just want to make sure that whatever focuser you end up with will be connecting to your telescope easily. So for that, you want to check with the manufacturer maybe. So I know that the Sesto Senso, for example, does not work on Vixen uh, telescope focusers. And my EAF actually needed to buy an adapter plate that's available in Japan for, uh, that's not provided by ZW, by a third, third party, to properly attach my EAF to this Vixen telescope. 
Um, so it, it, you know, it all depends on your focuser. Uh, so that focusing me mechanism here and the electronic uh, focuser that you choose. So make absolutely sure that you'll be able to connect your focuser to your telescope. And besides that, there's really not too much to look into, to look for in the focuser that you buy. Um, it might be better if, I, if it has a temperature sensor, but this is something that I've never used uh, personally. I prefer to just refocus throughout the night when the F F HFR changes dramatically or when after a certain uh, period of time has changed, uh, has elapsed, sorry, but uh, it did, does give you more flexibility if you have the uh, temperature sensor in the focuser. The reason being that when the temperature changes throughout the night, the metal in your telescope, for example, will expand or contract a little bit, and that tiny bit is actually enough to put you out of focus. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, even the optical elements themselves uh, can be subject to that. So you'll see like lenses with a lo lot of glass in there uh, are quite subject to that temperature focus shift. Um, so with that electronic uh, focuser, once you've attached it, it will basically just, you have a motor that will rotate this, uh, this particular knob here and thus change the focus, the distance between get my camera and uh, the actual uh, telescope tube itself. And with that, I can focus and I can also do auto focusing, which is super important. And I can do what is called filter offsets. Remember how I mentioned that the thickness of your filters or even the wavelengths of light that they let through can affect the uh, focus point? Well, you can measure how much each filter affects that focus point and uh, set up focuser offset, focus offsets, saying like, okay, if it's this L filter, and if, if I go from my luminance filter to my red filter, I should move this focuser by seven steps in the N direction. That's what the focus offset says. And if you program that, when you change filters, you don't need to autofocus, you just need to, uh, to move the focuser by a certain amount of steps and it all works great. So one of the things though with the focuser when you're choosing it, you want to double check the reviews to see whether they are getting uh, accurate autofocus and repeatable autofocus. And I will add there is one thing, one thing you want to avoid at all costs. I don't care how, how cheap it is. If you want to be lazy and unfrustrated, do not get a DC focuser. You'll see that focusers come in two var var varieties. Some is a DC motor, and others with a stepper motor. And in particular, those with a stepper motor, they have something uh, called absolute positioning. And if you want reliable autofocus runs that are repeatable and frustration free, you absolutely want a stepper motor with absolute po positioning. You have some uh, focus controllers that simulate absolute po positioning with a DC motor. Don't I mean, yes, it can kind of work, but it's a source of frustration and I do not recommend that. I recommend a true stepper motor with um, absolute positioning of the focuser. So make sure that is the case before buying. All of the focusers that I mentioned in this video are like that. Uh, if you do not know what the difference between a DC motor and a, a stepper motor is, basically a stepper motor can uh, rotate by steps, as its name would imply, one step at a time, and you can actually tell it to rotate a certain number of steps, and you know exactly what impact that will have on your focus. And you can say like, okay, uh, I was on step 250, I went to step 257, come back to step 250, and it can do that on its own. A DC motor does not have a concept of step. It only has uh, the duration and the voltage more or less that you apply to that focusing mo motor and a, a pulse that you send will move the motor by a certain amount but that amount actually will depend on the temperature of the motor as well uh, it's not fully reliable it can work but honestly just spend the couple more the, the hundred dollars more to get even this zweef another thing with focusers is backlash and slippage. Uh, backlash is when you reverse the focuser directions, then there's a little bit, bit of time be before the gears of the focuser are engaged again and before the focuser actually starts rotating. And there are very 
good ways to do backlash compensation in most software packages that are out there, including Nina, which I use, our uh, Sequence Gener Generator Pro, uh, other controlling software. Uh, in Nina, the best method is called the overshoot method, which is the default mo method in Sequence Gener Generator Pro, for example. Um, the backlash itself for, for the EEF, it's a bit of a lottery. My own EEF has around 80 to 90 steps of backlash, if I remember correctly. Uh, some EF owners report no backlash whatsoever. Some report uh, a backlash of 200. Uh, it's very variable between units apparently. And, uh, and thank you so much for actually giving me more data points um, to people who contacted me on Facebook uh, about that. So this is, the backlash is something to keep in mind, but it is not the end of the world. And the backlash had frustrated me with this EF, which is why I had originally called it a hot piece of garbage or something like that. It is not. For its price, it's decent. It has a very significant amount of backlash, but it can be countered using overshoot method. It's not ideal. It's not as good as a moonlight focuser that did not have any backlash, maybe a couple of steps uh, for me, but it works decently. So this works well. Just avoid a DC motor based focuser. And you'll want to double check on forums like Cloudy Nights or Stargazer Lounge or, as, or various astronomy forums about whether this focuser works well for your telescope and whether people have been able to get good results out of it. And this is important because as you can see, the focuser will work together with the filter wheel. Another thing that we'll see with the focuser is that most focusers, although if you build your own, you can kind of get away with, um, uh, without that, but most focusers will require 12 volts input uh, in power. So the focuser will require 12 volts, your cold camera will require 12 volts, your mount will require 12 volts. Uh, so things to keep in mind, power management is another thing that I'll cover in one of my future videos uh, in here. If you're using the astromechanics focuser for a cannon lens that I mentioned in previous videos, then you do not need a separate power source. This one does have uh, a separate power source. So something to keep in mind, although uh, it's not a, the end of the world. Another thing as well, and this is something I mentioned when about the, the scope selection, is uh, if you have a helicoidal focuser, which is uh, a focuser that you, you, you don't turn a knob and then goes up and down. There's like across the whole focusing system, there's a big ring, like a camera lens really, where you just turn that ring and it adjusts the focus. And those are the most difficult to have uh, focus motors or w working on. So most of the time, those focus motor motors, they will use what is called a belt uh, system, where you have just a belt that's tightened between your hel helicoidal focuser and the uh, actual electronic uh, focuser motor. And that can be subject to slipping. And slipping is not something you can counter by software. And you need to adjust the tension of the belt. I've noticed that depending on the way you attach it, it can actually shake your telescope while you're focusing, which can be a problem for guiding. Um, although there is a workaround in software in Nina, for example. So it gets a bit more complicated with helicoidal focusers, which is why I would not recommend them. I would recommend uh, a system with a Crayford or rack and pinion type of, uh, uh, of focuser like we have here, a knob that basically changes the distance directly and then you can add the focuser on top. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this video. So we did cover quite a lot of ground in terms of the filter wheel, if you have a monochrome camera, and the focuser. Uh, note that even if you have a color camera, you will need the electronic uh, focuser because of temperature changes throughout the night. Um, and that is important. If you don't have it, then you could focus very accurately at the beginning of this, the night with a bad enough mask, but by the end of the night, you would have drifted out of focus. It's especially true even if you're using an OSC camera with a schmidt cassegrain type of telescope because the mirror itself can shift and change the focus in addition to the temperature. So it's, you really, really want that uh, electronic focuser regardless of whether you've chosen to go monochrome our one-shot color uh, camera. And so uh, that's, uh, that's it for uh, this session. Thank you so much for watching. 
Um, I hope it was a useful uh, session. Uh, if it was useful, if you liked it, please click on the light, uh, like button below. Please also feel free to go down into the comments and give me any input you have with regards to uh, filter wheels and electronic uh, focusers. Um, please also, if, uh, if you're interested in this series, don't forget to subscribe if you're not subscribed already. If you are, thank you so much and thanks so much for watching. And uh, if you do subscribe, please also don't forget to click on the little notification bell icon so you can get uh, notified when there's a new video coming in this series or other series that I have uh, running. In further videos I'll be talking about things like power management so like the, the 12 volts that I was mentioning, USB management along with cable management which I'm terrible at so I won't be a good reference but I'll be linking to better references than me and uh, I'll also be talking in the end about the whole control uh, system of the telescope. What will what will all those USB cables and, uh, and power cables connect to? And uh, it could be a PC, it could be an integrated solution like the AC ASI Air, it could be uh, a, a Raspberry, another non-integrated uh, Raspberry solution uh, based on a, a distribution called Astroberry, or it could be a simple Windows PC, which is what I used with Nina, or a Sequence Generator Pro. And that's coming up in uh, new episodes, so feel, make sure not to miss them. But again, thank you so much for watching today. I hope uh, this was useful. Whenever you can, don't forget to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.